So imagine waking up and all of a sudden your house is filled with frogs. Imagine that experience. We're beginning a new series in our time in Exodus called Are You Ready to Rumble? Because God is ready to rumble with all of the gods of Egypt. And today, frogs are going to be everywhere in your home, in your house, in your bedroom, in every aspect of Egypt. And it's not because God said, what would be cool? Frogs. It's because there was a specific Egyptian god. Her name was Hackett. Hackett had a, a human body up to the neck, and she had a frog head for her face. And several things you need to know about the Egyptian god of Hackett to understand why God chose the frog plague to communicate to the Egyptians that he was supreme over the realm of Hackett. Hackett was the Greek, uh, sorry, the Egyptian goddess of childbirth, so you wanted the frogs to help you during the time of birth. She was the goddess of, of creation because every year you'd come to the Nile and there would be just tens of thousands of tadpoles. And so you trusted in Hackett to give birth to you the way she gave birth to the Nile. In Egyptian hieroglyphics, when you see a tadpole, it actually was a symbol for the number 100,000. Because when they saw a tadpole, they thought, man, there's hundreds of thousands of tadpoles. When you see in Egyptian hieroglyphics the frog, it was the symbol for rebirth. Because in the Egyptian uh, pantheon and the belief of uh, reincarnation, Hackett was part of the process of you dying and being reborn again. Because of that, when you saw a frog, you never killed it. Because it might be your grandmother or your great-grandmother. And so part of their, their mythology or their belief in the life and afterlife, they couldn't kill the frogs, which is going to be important when you have all these frogs. They're not able to actually destroy them because of that as well. Hackett was married to a god we talked about a few weeks ago called Cunham, and he was her husband who took the, the silt from the Nile, and the mythology was that he formed mankind uh, with his hands like on a pottery wheel. So it's into this world and it's into this mythology that God wants to communicate that Hackett is not the real God. She is not the one you should trust. He is the one that's supreme. And what we're going to see in this passage is how he's going to work with Pharaoh and we're going to see how Pharaoh slowly rejects God. Each plague, but this plague in particular, we see several stages. It's probably important to see what he does with Pharaoh using a, a well-traveled analogy, the story of how to boil a frog. As you know, frogs are cold-blooded. And so if you take a, a, a cold-blooded frog and you throw him in a, a, a pot of boiling water, he'll immediately jump out because of the reaction. But if you put that same cold-blooded frog into a pot and you slowly turn up the heat, his body will adjust. Then you turn up the heat, his body will adjust. You turn up the heat, his body will adjust. And you can actually, if you do it slowly enough, I haven't done it, I'm not recommending it, but I've heard, you can actually boil a frog alive by just turning up the heat a little bit at a time and his body adjusts to the culture, to the temptation, and to the surrounding circumstances. Several stages to boil a frog. In the same way, we're going to see Pharaoh's heart is boiled, his conscience is boiled, his rejection toward God is boiled through these different stages. You see, boiling a frog occurs one stage at a time, Losing your innocence occurs one stage at a time. Losing touch with the sensitivity to God's Spirit occurs one stage at a time. And I hope we're going to see that many of the stages that Pharaoh walks in, we might be on the road to having our own heart and faith boiled. And God is calling us back to freedom. Because we've had folks in our life that we've seen them begin to take these steps. You go to a family reunion, you got that, that family reunion, you're like... Why do you always be the victim? Why can't you be more thankful? Why are you so critical? And you're begging somebody. Why can't you see how deep you're going into this hole? It's a rebellious son. It's a rebellious family member who's chosen alcohol over your family. Chosen pornography over your marriage. And you're just wondering, why do you keep going into... No, 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 don't. And God is going to say the same thing as Pharaoh is slowly getting deeper and deeper into the water. Don't. Stop, stop, stop. Oh, it's painful there. Come back. And I think God is going to teach us this so that we can avoid a lot of pain. But also, that no matter what stage you're on, God wants to make a way back. You see His mercy, His compassion in the midst of it. Stage one. God turns to Pharaoh. One of the first stages 
when God wants to begin to call you back to him is he's going to give you over to your gods. In this case, Hackett, the frog god. See, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, here's the consequences. I will smite all of your territory with your gods, with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house. Look how many times it says your, your house, your territory. Those frogs that you've worshipped, that you think is the source of your identity, they're going to come into your bedroom. They're going to be on your bed. Ironically, since that was the goddess who gave you childbirth, you're going to have plenty of that God in your life. Into the house of your servants into the house of your people, into your ovens, into your kneading bowls, and the frogs shall come up on you, on your people, and on your servants. I think what's helpful is that God loves us enough that if we want to put something in our life that's more important than Him, usually it's a good thing. Now we look at this kind of thing and we say, oh, those, those ancient people, so primitive with their hack at gods. <laughs> silly, silly, silly. But we do the same thing. We take some good thing, turn it into an ultimate thing. And God says, that is not going to ultimately satisfy. But if you choose to keep that thing as number one in your life, God will first give you over to that. All right, I will let you see what it's like. So work becomes your God. And so God woos you back. Work's a great thing. Just don't make it your ultimate thing. But you say, no, no, it's it's how I define my identity. It's how I find my purpose. And so God gives you over to that for a season. And you start noticing that you're more and more stressed because you can't quite suck all the amount of, of energy and, and, and meaning you want out of it to the point at which you start to see sacrifices. Your marriage is affected by it. The doctor tells you your health is being affected by it. All of a sudden, you, you find yourself realizing that by making work first, a lot of the other things you care about are beginning to disintegrate. God's giving you over to that idol. Others of us speak, well, I'm not like that because I'm a, I'm a family person. But you find your identity, your full identity in being a good mom or being a good dad. And, and if you make that your ultimate identity, God will give you over to that. And pretty soon, instead of just loving your kids and caring for your kids, you need your kids to find your own identity. And they start to resent you for it. Because instead of giving to them, you're using them to feed your own self. And they feel smothered by that. And the very thing you got your identity from is beginning to disintegrate because you're trying to pull out of it what's not there. Ultimate, eternal meaning. You hold on to worry, your anger. And God's saying, let go, let go, let go. But finally, he gives you over to that anger. And giving you over to it, the doctor's telling you, you got ulcers because you're worrying. Because you're trying to control the world. And God's giving you over to it and saying, alright, if you think worrying helps, I'll give you over to it. Oh, my goodness, I can't handle this. And it's a stage of God's mercy trying to call you back to him to say, those gods, those good things will not ultimately satisfy. God gives you over to your gods. That's stage one. And he, he hopes there's enough of a sting. You're like, oh, God, I'm back. <laughs> Woo, you be God. I won't. But rarely do we repent on the first stage. Instead, he's got to turn up the heat. That certainly is true with it, Pharaoh. So we compound the problem by rationalizing rather than repenting. The instinct of the human heart is not to go, wow, I'm wrong. Wow, sorry, God, let me come back. The instinct is always to rationalize and to make excuses. And we see that in Pharaoh as well. The Lord spoke to Moses. Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand over the over all the streams, over the rivers, the ponds, cause frogs to come out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. At that point, Pharaoh, the story could be, oh, my goodness, there's frogs everywhere. Our gods are out of control. Clearly, our gods can't handle the frog population. God really is the one true God. That's how the story could have happened. God, we repent. We repent. But instead, he rationalizes. He says, oh, that's not really God. Your God's not really in charge of the frogs. Come on, magicians, where's the magicians? Come out here. The magicians come out. What do you need, Pharaoh? Show them this isn't really God. All right, so magicians come out, and look what the magicians do. And the magicians did so, they made frogs, with all their enchantments. And they brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. 
Now, does this make any sense at all? If you have a frog problem and you're calling out the magicians, do you ask them to add more frogs? No, you call the magicians and say, hey, if you're real magicians, take care of the frogs. But this is what happens when you rationalize rather than repenting. You compound the problem. Somebody confronts you. And maybe they do it right. Maybe they do it in an appropriate way. But they come to you and say, hey, I notice that there's some ways you're beginning to fudge the truth. You're beginning to lie. The, the way in which you're telling things isn't exactly how it happened. And you could say, oh, my goodness. I'm thinking about that circumstances at work or you know, conversation we had. You are right. I really did fudge the truth. I, I, I'm sorry. That would be repentance. But rarely does that how we first react. Instead, when you're caught in a lie, you usually compound it by adding more lies, don't you? You add more frogs. You try and get out of the consequences by adding lies to lies, adding frogs to frogs. Somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I was in that small group the other day, or, or I saw you the other day uh, uh, at, at that business meeting, and it just seemed like the way you talked about so-and-so, it just seemed like I was a little uncomfortable. It seemed like we're getting a little bit into gossip, and I'd just like to stay away from that line. Who do you think you are calling me a gossip? And so what do you do? You go, well, thank you for your feedback. And then you go call somebody up and you gossip about the person who told you you were gossiping about somebody else. Right? You compound the problem of not addressing your gossip by adding more gossip. Somebody confronts you about some area that you've uh, become lustful about. It might be lustful for power or for fame or for pleasure, whatever it is. And instead of... Con- Addressing that lust, you just swap lust. You move from power to fame. You move from approval to performance. You just swap gods. You don't repent. Or somebody comes up and tells you you've got maybe a problem being a little too judgmental. So what do you do? You judge the person causing you being judgmental. That's the problem in our hearts. We're not quick to repent. Instead, we just add frogs to frogs. And things get worse. I read a book, uh, I saw a speaker a couple years ago who wrote a book called Crucial Conversations. He says, this shows up all the time in marriage. He's writing a book on crucial conversations, which is the ability to hear feedback, not get defensive, and to really integrate, integrate those changes. That's his expert opinion. I mean, that's his, his thing he teaches on. And yet he says, the heart doesn't want to do it. So he gets, gets a brand new toothbrush. It's this really cool uh, toothbrush. It's electric, and he's using it, and he's getting all toothbrush brushed. And his wife says, hey, can I talk to you about something? Sure, what's going on? I really feel like you're not prioritizing what we've talked about. Every time you get done brushing your teeth, there's just stuff splattered all over the mirror. And we've talked about this several times, and it just seems like you don't wipe it down. Either I'm not important or you're not hearing, you don't care. And so as the guy who is the expert at crucial conversations and receiving feedback, what's his instinct? I'm sorry, honey? No. What are you talking about? No, that is not right. I can't believe you would say that. I can't believe the way you said it. You're being so judgmental. You're being so unappreciative. It's not a big deal. Don't be so anal. You know what? I'm not sleeping in bed with you tonight. So he goes downstairs and he's sleeping on the couch. And he's thinking to himself, she's feeling bad now. Any minute she's going to realize what a bad wife she's been, how inappropriate that conversation was. Boy, haven't you done that? That's what it looks like to rationalize. I'm not wrong. And you're hoping the other person's doing what you should be doing. Listening, reflecting, and repenting. He doesn't. Instead, he adds frogs to the frogs, which moves us to stage three. We're now moving deeper and deeper into the hot water. This is where you get to a place that I want to call relief repentance, not genuine repentance. And and this is, again, God calling you back. Because every time there's a stage at which God says, Hey, I wanted to give you some relief, but I'm trying to get you to repent. But many of us take relief repentance over genuine repentance. So now there's frogs everywhere. Frog here, frog there, frog, 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 frog. And oh my goodness, the circumstance has gotten so bad that Pharaoh says, Where's Moses? Where's Aaron? Get him in here. Emergency meeting. They come in. Please, 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 please entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs. Take away the circumstances. Take away the croaking from me. And from my people. And if you'll do that, if you'll give me relief, I will let the people go that they can make sacrifice the Lord. Whatever they're doing. Just the point is, get rid of the frogs. Relief repentance. It's not I'm genuinely saying, well, I've been worshiping the wrong God. Hack it. 
And wow, your God really is in control. That would be genuine repentance. It goes deeper than just external appearance. It's deeper than just changing your behavior. It's longer lasting. Relief repentance is when you say, I just don't want the consequences of what I've done. And that's where he's at. We'll find out by the time we get to stage seven. It's very clear. But here, what looks like repentance. Wow, Pharaoh, he's doing it. Entreat God and I'll let you go. But it's not really. I mentioned over the last few months, it's just been a very challenging time. And, and so I found lots. One of the, the gods I thought God was convicting me of was self-sufficiency. And so I've been doing just a lot of prayer and a lot of dependence. And that passage in John 15 that says, without me, you can do nothing. God, I, I don't really live that way. I want to. I want to believe today I can do nothing without you. And my goodness, God has just increased my confidence. In the last eight weeks, has been in him uh, a lot of, of less pain. There's been a lot of better circumstances going on. And I've noticed several times that my prayer life has been just in line with my circumstances. As my circumstance and problems got lower, my prayers got lower. And I went, oh, oh no. I only wanted relief from the circumstances. I'm not actually seeking God as much now. So several times over the last couple weeks, I'm like, God, please, 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 please. I don't want to learn the hard way. Please, 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 please. I really am depending on you. I want to pray just as much now when things are going well as they're going bad. God, I want my, I want genuine repentance. I don't want just relief repentance. I got to tell you how many times as we're helping folks as a staff over the years, people get to this stage where there's really bad circumstances. I had a guy about a year and a half ago who said, you've got to come to my house right now. I've got to be here in five minutes. So I went over and he said, I- I'm in trouble. You know, I, I got this long, long-term long pornography issue that came out that showed a bunch of relationships that are going out. And, and you know, we were praying together. He's like, I need to accept Christ right now. And, and we had this great, genuine, there's tears and there's prayers. And it's a powerful moment. And I got him hooked up with a friend and a counselor and a Bible study. And and uh, I followed up a few weeks later. And, oh, I had a Bible study. It went really well. And, and then a second Bible study I called. I said, hey, just want to make sure that the tracks we gave you are helpful and, and moving you forward. And he's like, we're fine. We're, we're fine. In fact, I've probably got a little too personal in those conversations. I just know we're, we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Didn't follow up with the Bible studies. Didn't follow up with the counseling. Didn't really dig into the 15, 20-year pattern. I went back to the time he was 14. He got just a little bit enough relief. To go and hide behind the idol of his image. And say the image is more important to me. That's my real God. Rather than being genuine and repenting to what God wants. That's exactly what Pharaoh's going to do. Look when we get to stage four. Because now that it looks like he's being repentant. God says to him. Alright then here's your chance. Here's your move. It's your decision. You can either give up control to me. Or this will be another opportunity to take control as you go deeper and deeper into the boiling water. So here's the decision you're always going to have when it comes to repentance. Will you give up control or will you take more control? And it is hilarious. Moses turns to Pharaoh. Great, you're repentant. That's awesome. Accept the honor. It's an interesting phrase. It's a phrase used in the Egyptian culture when an inferior was talking to a superior. To say, hey your move in the king james it literally says all right glory over me another way if you translate that maybe in a vernacular in our day moses turns to pharaoh and says all right thy will be done what do you want me to do your will be done of saying when shall i intercede for you when should we get rid of the frogs when should we get rid of the frogs for you for your servants and for your people when do you want us to destroy the frogs for you and your houses that they would just go back to the river. And what's the answer? Somebody comes to you and says, when do you want to be free from bitterness? When do you want to be free from, from self-centeredness? When do you want to be free from identifying yourself as a victim? When do you want to be free from those altars? What should the answer be? No! But the human heart never does that. The human always says exactly what Pharaoh says. Tomorrow. I'll work on it tomorrow. You know what? I've always had an anger problem because I'm Irish. Maybe someday I'll work on it, but not today. You know, I've always had a problem with lust, and I'm able to keep it contained. It's not that big of a deal, so tomorrow. And the reason I think Pharaoh says tomorrow is because Pharaoh still wants to be in control. He wants to be able to protect his image. He wants to go before the people and to say, Tomorrow the frogs will be gone. And I, the Pharaoh, the God of Egypt, declare it. He's still about image protection, not repentance. And so instead of giving up control and saying, God, 
You're the one true God. We need the frogs gone now. He chooses to take control by saying no tomorrow. Because protecting his image was more important than genuine repentance. When I was 23, we had a small group at my house, and we were going through a study called Like a Rock. And I, 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 we divided the men into groups. We sort of met together and, and had some just hangout time. Then the men had a small group in, in one room, and Beth, uh, my wife, and the women had one another. And one day we were sharing, I said, you know, one of the things I want to work on, I took my last name, H-O-V-I-N-D, and each one was an acronym for a character quality I was working on. So the V of Hovind was for Verify Me. I said, I'm noticing a pattern in my life of fudging the truth on stories to make myself look better than I am. So, well, give me an example. I said, well, somebody will come to me and say, hey, uh, do, you, do you play sports these days? I said, oh, yeah, I play volleyball every Thursday night. In fact, I play up at Kennestone about 45 minutes from here. Uh, love playing. I played since college. I play in an A-League up there. Uh, we have a great time. We play about three hours every Thursday night and just love it. Well, that was true. If you came on Thursday nights, I did play there, and 95% of those facts were true. It just wasn't an A-League. I played in a B-League. I used to play in the A-League in college. Probably, for those of you who don't play volleyball, like A, B, what does it even mean? It was sort of silly. But I was just adding little facts to the story to make myself look better, sort of making me look better than I was for really silly reasons, except my security was somehow found in these little fudges. We got done talking that day. A friend of mine who was a custom home builder and uh, was uh, starting his own business, he came up, he said, oh, I can't believe you shared that out loud. I, I do that probably ten times a day in manufacturing an image about myself, I just realized I need to start pursuing truth in the little details of my life as well. It just became a great time in, in our marriage and as guys being honest with how do we not be about image manufacturing, tomorrow I'm in charge versus God. I want truth to be in charge of my life. How do you wait on tomorrow? Is it procrastination toward God, toward others, toward repentance? Is it taking control instead of giving up control? Is it just an obstinate heart? Is it withdrawing affection from God or for other people in order to control situation? There's so many brands of tomorrow. But it's not repentance. Which moves us to stage five. Stage five is that at the end of the day, the Passover is a, a freedom story. God is saying, I want people to be free. Free from your gods, free from your bitterness, free from your lusts. I want you to be part of the freedom story. And here's what the book of Exodus could have said. Here's what the story could have been. Pharaoh, let my people go. Sounds great. I'd love to be part of the freedom story. And we could be reading Exodus 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 and hear about a Pharaoh who turned his heart around and he was part of leading the people of God out of his, out of his land as he repented of his bondage. That could have been the freedom story. That could be our freedom story. But usually it's not. Usually we have to go deeper and deeper into the water. And the irony is you're going to be part of God's story one way or another. It can be in light of your obedience or can it be despite your disobedience. But at the end of the day, you will be part of God's story. Pharaoh is very much part of the story. Will you be part of God's story, Pharaoh? No! I'm not going to be part of that freedom story. I'm not going to be part of this. I will never let those people go. And here we are 2,000 years later reading about Pharaoh, who's right in the middle of God's story. God will use your obedience to be part of his story, or he will use your disobedience to be part of the story. But he is so committed to freedom, he will move you toward freedom one way or another. He said, tomorrow... If Moses said, well, let it be according to your word if you want to wait till tomorrow. But just know this while you're trying to tell the people you're still in charge. There is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will depart from you, not because of Hackett, but because of Yahweh. They'll depart from your houses and from your servants and from your people, and they will remain in the river also. And God will use your tomorrowness, your rebellion, your passiveness to bring about his story. But Pharaoh hasn't rebelled. He's just allowed the heat to go a little bit higher. Which moves us to stage six. God is going to let the consequences of your lies or your lusts or your worrying or your anger or your you know, defining yourself by your beauty or your appearance, all the things, he's just going to let the consequences pile up until you're like, oh, this is so painful, I need to repent. Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. And Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs, which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs 
died. Out of the houses, and out of the courtyards, and out in the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps. The NSB says they piled up and the land stank. And here's what happens as you just keep allowing yourself to be boiled, is there's piles of stinking frogs all over your life. And originally, you can manage it. You keep it sort of the secret in, in the closet of your life. And it's like, oh my goodness. Don't go in there. But then you realize that, oh my goodness. I've been telling this story about what my father-in-law, what my brother-in-law, what my sister, what my parents did for 10 years. The bitterness in my life stinks. And every year, I'm not getting freer. It just stinks more. You know, first it was just one lie. But then I had to get this lie to cover up that lie and this lie to cover up that lie. And now you're just covered with stink. And God's saying, stop stinking. Come back to me. No, no, I can manage this. I I can hold one more. God said, don't you want to be part of a freedom story where you get to bless your kids and affirm your kids? Well, my dad couldn't affirm or bless me. Yeah, don't you have a lot of stink in your life from not having that blessing? Yeah. Isn't it time for you to not wait till tomorrow, but today say, I want to affirm my kids the way God affirms me, not the way my dad didn't? Isn't it time to stop picking up the hurts and the pains and the bruises from the past and instead say, God, the consequences are piled up. I want to go a different way. I want to be part of a freedom story. And God says, yes, that's what I want for you. The problem is we don't see it. Everyone around you can see it. It stinks around here. You think you're fooling everybody. You're not fooling God and you're not fooling others. You're just fooling yourself. You could ask your kids. You could ask your colleagues. They all know it. The only person who doesn't know it is you and you think you're fooling everybody. And God says, come on. It's piled up everywhere and trying to get us out of our self-deception. One of my favorite stories in C.S. Lewis is The Great Divorce tells a story of a, the fact that in hell, people are just totally unaware of how they've rationalized everything. So in the story, it's a bus ride from hell to heaven, and the ghosts, who have just given away more and more of themselves to other gods, have come up to heaven where the solid people live. And one day, one of the people from the bus ride from hell is walking by, and this is what happens. At that moment, we suddenly interrupted by a thin voice of a ghost, talking at enormous speed. Looking behind us, we saw the creature. It was addressing one of the solid people. And it was doing so very busily, uh, too busily for us to notice, to notice us. Every now and then, the solid spirit tried to get a word in edgewise, but without success. The ghost talk sounded like this. Oh, my dear, I've had such a dreadful time. I don't know how I ever got here at all. I was coming with Eleanor Stone, and we'd arranged the whole thing. We we're going to meet at the corner of Sink Street. I made it perfectly plain, because I knew what she was like. And if I told her once, I've told her a hundred times. I would not meet her outside that dreadful Major Banks woman's house. Not after how she's treated me. That was one of the most dreadful things that's ever happened to me. I've been dying to tell you because I felt for sure you'd tell me that I acted rightly here. No, wait a moment, dear, till I've told you. I tried living with her when I first came. It was all fixed up. She was going to do the cooking and I was going to you know, look after the house. And I did think I was going to be comfortable after all I'd been through. But she turned out to be so changed so absolutely selfish and not a particle of sympathy for anyone but herself and as i once said to her i do think i'm entitled to a little consideration because you at least lived out your time but i ought to have been here for years and years yet oh but of course dear i'm forgetting you don't know i was murdered on earth simply murdered dear that man should never have operated i ought to be alive today but they simply starved me in that dreadful nursing home and no one ever came near me The shrill, monotonous whine died away as the speaker, still accompanied by the bright patience by her side, moved out of our hearing. What troubles you, says the angel? I'm troubled, sir, because that unhappy creature doesn't seem to me to be the sort of soul that ought to be in the danger of damnation. She isn't wicked. She's just a silly, complaining old woman who has got into the habit of grumbling. And she feels that a little kindness and rest and change would would do her all right. Well, this is what she once was. That is maybe what she still is. If so, she certainly will be cured. But the whole question is whether she is now a grumbler. A grumbler. I should have thought there was no doubt about that. Aye, but you misunderstand me. The question is whether she's a grumbler or has she become the thing 
she made herself to be simply a grumble. If there's a real woman still in there, even the least trace of one still there inside the grumbling, it can be brought back to life again. If there's one wee spark under all those ashes, we'll blow it until the whole pile is red and clear. But if there's nothing but ashes, we'll go on blowing them in our eyes forever. They will be swept up. How can there be a grumble without a grumbler? Here's a woman who spent her whole life being a victim, being a grumbler, blaming other people. It's everyone else's fault. And she doesn't even know she's moved from being a woman who grumbles into just becoming the thing she worshipped, an ongoing grumble. It's my problem. It's your problem. We don't see the grumbling piling up. We don't see the lies piling up. We don't see all the things piling up. Instead of moving toward repentance, we take one more step deeper to stage seven. And this is why we see the repentance has never been genuine. Temporary relief from your circumstances leads to short-term repentance. You see, when Pharaoh saw that the frogs were gone, and there was relief, oh, the frogs are gone, he immediately hardened his heart and did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. Every stage, God loves us enough to give us deeper and deeper over to our God's. In every stage, he puts out his hand. Come on back. Come on back. Come on back. i got a freedom story for you. But often instead, we harden our heart and we miss out on the opportunity to move toward freedom. So here's the challenge, I think, for us. Where are you on this journey? I love this phrase, one frog turns to the other and says, No, I don't believe it's getting warmer in here. Why do you ask, Fred? Fred! Don't wait till tomorrow to repent. Today is the day of salvation. Don't exchange tomorrow's repentance or today's repentance because of tomorrow's relief. Say, God, I want to be close to you no matter what the circumstances. I want to be connected to you no matter what. And you know what you really need is not just to change your behavior. I mean, think about those seven steps we looked at in your program and say, wow, I'm doing number two and number four. Oh, God, help me with number five. Really identify one of those steps and begin to ask God to, to move, north, move close to him. And he will. But I don't want this just to be about external behavior changes. You've got to get to the God behind the behavior. Because you know what a frog really needs? A blood transfusion. The reason a frog can be boiled alive is because it's cold-blooded. If a frog was warm-blooded, he'd react a lot quicker. And that's why Jesus comes into Passover to offer a blood transfusion. The problem is we're cold-blooded. We're self-centered. We, we adapt to our culture. We adapt to temptations. We give in to other gods. God says, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come to a, a Passover lamb and ultimately through Jesus, and I'm going to give my blood so that I can transfer my warm-bloodedness, my other-centeredness, my I love Godness, my peace-centered, love-centered, joy-centered life, and I will transfuse that blood into yours. Not just as a one-time prayer, but every day you say, God, I need a blood transfusion again. I'm giving in to the pressures and the cultures and the temptations. God, blood transfusion. I need your life in me. Apart from you, I can do nothing. I'm becoming more and more aware, God, of not my need to control, but my need to give up control. I love how Tim Keller says it. We'll end with this. Thus, every person, religious or not, is worshiping something. Idols, pseudo-saviors, to get their sense of worth. But these things enslave us with guilt if we fail to attain them, because you can never have enough. Or anger if someone blocks us from getting it. Or fear if they're threatened. Oh my goodness, I'm not as beautiful as I used to be. My kids aren't as obedient as I used to be. Or drivenness since we must have them. Guilt, anger, and fear and drivenness are like a fire that destroys us. Sin is worshiping anything but Jesus. And the wages of sin is slavery. You want to trace and find out what your idol is? Look at your fears. Look at your guilt. Look at your drivenness. Use these as symptoms to find those things. And just know the whole time God has got his hand out and says, Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for freedom? Blood transfusion. I have what you need. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your story of freedom. Thank you for loving us enough to see examples of 
someone who's taken steps you don't want us to take. Thank you for your graciousness and kindness. No matter where we are, there's always a road back. That's what the Passover is about. That's what the cross is about. We thank you that it's not about us being perfect or even being good as much as us being close to you and allowing your goodness and your self-control and your love and your blood to, to, to pump through our veins. Father, we ask for each person here who you begin to tap on the shoulder and convict today, God, that this will be the beginning of a turning point toward finding you and finding your freedom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being here today. We're going to continue our journey in uh, Are You Ready to Rumble for the next couple weeks. Lots of cool things to learn. If you came prepared to give financially, some offering boxes on your way out, or we'd love to put a name with a face. If you're new, third door on your left is the hearth room. Thanks for being here today.